Chapter 21 Affirmation, Love, Acceptance, and Denial Now, affirmation means saying quote-unquote yes to yourself and to the life you lead and to accepting your own unique personhood. That affirmation means that you declare your individuality. Affirmation means that you embrace the life that is yours and flows through you. Your affirmation of yourself is one of your greatest strengths. You can at times quite properly deny certain portions of experience while still confirming your own vitality. You do not have to say yes to people, issues, or to events with which you are deeply disturbed. Affirmation does not mean a bland, wishy-washy acceptance of anything that comes your way, regardless of your feelings about it. Biologically, affirmation means health. You go along with your life, understanding that you form your experience, emphasizing your ability to do so. Affirmation does not mean sitting back and saying, I can do nothing, it is all in fate's hands, therefore whatever happens, happens. Affirmation is based upon the realization that no other consciousness is the same as your own, that your abilities are uniquely yours and like no others. It is the acceptance of your individuality in flesh. Basically, it is a spiritual, psychic, and biological necessity and represents your appreciation of your singular integrity. An atom can take care of itself, but atoms themselves are somewhat like domesticated animals. Joining in the biological family of the body, to some extent they become like friendly cats or dogs under your domain. Animals pick up the characteristics of their owners. Cells are highly influenced by your behavior and beliefs. If you affirm the rightness of your physical being, then you help the cells and organs in your body, and without knowing it, treat them kindly. If you do not trust your physical nature, you radiate this feeling also, regardless of what health procedures you may take. The cells and organs know that you do not trust them, even as animals do. In a way, you set up antibodies against yourself simply because you do not confirm the rightness of your physical being as it exists in space and time. You can affirm your uniqueness quite properly at times by saying no. Individuality grants you the right of making decisions. In your terms, this means saying yes or no. By implication, to always acquiesce may very well mean that you are denying your own personhood. I hate. A person who says, I hate, is at least stating that he has an I capable of hating. The one who says, I have no right to hate, is not facing his own individuality. A man or woman who knows hate also understands the difference between that emotion and love. The ambiguities, the contrasts, the similarities, the affirmation of the creature self allows for the free flow of emotion. Many disavow the experience of feelings they consider negative. They try to quote-unquote affirm what they think of as positive emotions. They do not permit themselves the dimensions of their creaturehood, and by pretending not to feel what they feel, they deny the integrity of their own experience. The emotions follow beliefs. They are natural, ever-changing states of feeling, each leading into another in a free flow of energy and activity, colorful, rich, glowing tints that bring variety to the quality of consciousness. Such states of personality can be compared to colors alone, bright and dark, the strong patterns of energy that always represent motion, life, and variety. To refuse them is futile. They are one of the means by which physically attuned consciousness knows itself. They are not destructive. One emotion is not good and another one evil. Emotions simply are. They are elements of the power of consciousness, filled with energy. They merge into a powerful sea of being when left alone. You cannot affirm one emotion and deny another without setting up barriers. You try to hide what you think of as negative feelings in the closet of your mind, as in the past they closeted insane relatives. All of this because you do not trust the aspects of your individuality in flesh. Affirmation 
means accepting your soul as it appears in your creaturehood. I said this earlier, but you cannot deny your creaturehood without denying your soul, and you cannot deny your soul without denying your creaturehood. Now, left alone, hate does not last. Often it is akin to love, for the hater is attracted to the object of his hatred by deep bonds. It can also be a method of communication, but it is never a steady, constant state, and will automatically change if not tampered with. If you believe that hate is wrong and evil, and then you find yourself hating someone, you may try to inhibit the emotion or turn it against yourself, raging against yourself rather than another. On the other hand, you may try to pretend the feeling out of existence, in which case you dam up that massive energy and cannot use it for other purposes. In its natural state, hatred has a powerful rousing characteristic that initiates change and action. Regardless of what you have been told, hatred does not initiate strong violence. As covered earlier in this book, the outbreak of violence is often the result of a built-in sense of powerlessness. Many who unexpectedly commit great crimes, sudden murders, even bringing about mass death, have a history of docility and conventional attitudes, and were considered models, in fact, of deportment. All natural aggressive elements were denied in their natures, and any evidence of momentary hatred was considered evil and wrong. As a result, such individuals find it difficult, finally, to express the most normal denial or to go against their given code of conventionality and respect. They cannot communicate as, say, even animals can, with their fellow men as far as the expression of a disagreement is concerned. Psychologically, only a massive explosion can free them. They feel so powerless that this adds to their difficulties, so they try to liberate themselves by showing great power in terms of violence. Some such individuals, model sons for example, who seldom even spoke back to their parents, were suddenly sent to war and given carte blanche to release all such feelings in combat, and I am referring particularly to the last two wars, not the Second World War. In these wars, aggressions could be released and codes still followed. The individuals were faced, however, with the horror of their violently released pent-up hatreds and aggressions. Seeing these bloody results, they became even more frightened, more awed by what they thought of as this terrible energy that sometimes seemed to drive them to kill. On their return home, the code of behavior changed back to one suited to civilian life, and they clamped down upon themselves again as hard as they could. Many would appear as super-conventional. The quote-unquote luxury of expressing emotion, even in exaggerated form, was suddenly denied them, and the sense of powerlessness grew by contrast. This is not to be a chapter devoted to war. However, there are a few points that I do want to make. It is a sense of powerlessness that also causes nations to initiate wars. This has little to do with their quote-unquote actual world situation or with the power that others might assign to them, but to an overall sense of powerlessness, even sometimes regardless of world dominance. In a way, I am sorry that this is not the place to discuss the Second World War, for it was also the result of a sense of powerlessness, which then erupted into a mass bloodbath on a grand scale. The same course was followed privately in the case of such individuals as just mentioned. Without going into any detail, I simply want to point out that in the United States, strong national efforts were made after World War II to divert the servicemen's energies into other areas on their return home. Many who entered that war feeling powerless were given advantages after it was over, incentives, education, benefits they did not have before it. They were given the means to power in their own eyes. They were also accepted home as heroes, and while many certainly were disillusioned, in the whole framework of the country's mood, the veterans were welcomed. I am speaking generally now about the war under discussion, for there were certainly exceptions, yet most of the men involved in it learned something from their experiences. They turned against the idea of violence, and each in his own way recognized the personal psychological ambiguities of their feelings during combat. 
They were told by politicians that it was to be the last war, and the irony is that most of those in uniform believed it. The lie did not become truth, but it became more nearly so, for despite their failures, the ex-servicemen managed to bring up children who would not go to war willingly, who would question its premise. In an odd way, this made it even more difficult for those who did go into the next two, less extensive wars, for the country was not behind either one. Any sense of powerlessness on the part of individual fighting men was given expression as before, this time in a more local bloodbath, but the code itself had become shaky. The release was not as accepted as it had been before, even within the ranks. By the last war in Vietnam, the country was as much against it as for it, and the men's feelings of powerlessness were reinforced after it was over. This is the reason for the incidence of violence on the part of returning servicemen. Hate, left alone then, does not erupt into violence. Hatred brings a sense of power and initiates communication and action. In your terms, it is the buildup of natural anger. In animals, say, it would lead to a face-to-face -face encounter of battle stances in which each creature's body language, motion, and ritual would serve to communicate a dangerous position. One animal or the other would simply back down. Growling or roaring might be involved. Power would be effectively shown, but symbolically. This type of animal encounter occurs infrequently, for the animals involved would have had to ignore or short-circuit many lesser preliminary anger or initiation encounters, each meant to make positions clear and to ward off violence. Another small point here. Christ's dictum to turn the other cheek was a psychologically crafty method of warding off violence, not of accepting it. Symbolically, it represented an animal showing its belly to an adversary. The remark was meant symbolically. On certain levels, it was the gesture of defeat that brought triumph and survival. It was not meant to be the cringing act of a martyr who said, Hit me again, but represented a biologically pertinent statement a communication of body language. It would cleverly remind the attacker of the quote-unquote old communicative postures of the sane animals. Now, love is also a great inciter to action and utilizes dynamos of energy. Love and hate are both based upon self-identification in your experience. You do not bother to love or hate persons you cannot identify with at all. They leave you relatively untouched. They do not elicit deep emotion. Hatred always involves a painful sense of separation from love, which may be idealized. A person you feel strongly against at any given time upsets you because he or she does not live up to your expectations. The higher your expectations, the greater any divergence from them seems. If you hate a parent, it is precisely because you expect such love a person from whom you expect nothing will never earn your bitterness. In a strange manner, then, hatred is a means of returning to love, and left alone and expressed, it is meant to communicate a separation that exists in relation to what is expected. Love, therefore, can contain hate very nicely. Hatred can contain love and be driven by it, particularly by an idealized love. You quote-unquote hate something that separates you from a loved object. It is precisely because the object is loved that it is so disliked if expectations are not met. You may love a parent, and if the parent does not seem to return the love and denies your expectations, then you may quote-unquote hate the same parent because of the love that leads you to expect more. The hatred is meant to get your love back. It is supposed to lead to a communication from you, stating your feelings, clearing the air, so to speak, and bringing you closer to the love object. Hatred is not the denial of love, then, but an attempt to regain it, and a painful recognition of circumstances that separates you from it. 